All right. So this question was brought to us. Actually, we have two questions from Hannah Perlman. So how do you program or incorporate strength training for youth or adaptive athletes? So um, this is a really great question because um, we believe that young adults, adolescents, teenagers, and even kids can start strength training early. And we, at various stages, depending on their cognitive skills, their motor skill development, their interest, and their abilities, we're going to program strength and their sports, you know, what other sports they're playing outside of resistance training or strength training. So I would say the younger the person is, the less it's going to look like barbell training and the more it's going to look like play um, or other exercises in the gym. Um, And for the younger athletes or the younger trainees who are in, I would say the youngest that we probably start is like 10 years old is probably the youngest Um, that's when they, you know, depending on their motor skills and their movement abilities, that's when like some people are ready to barbell train. Although you see it all over the internet these days, all over social media, you see like the five-year-olds barbell training or doing the Olympic weight lifts. And it's so cool to watch, you know? Um, and the youth division for USA powerlifting starts at age eight. Seven. Oh yeah. Eight. Um, so listen, if someone, if that kid, if that particular kid expresses direct interest in using the barbell we just have to find equipment that works for them so there are training bars um, light bars there are training plates that are as light as five pounds or two and a half kilos Um, I think that's the lightest that they sell yeah and it's hard the plates or the yeah yeah the bump like the training plates yeah Yep. But they're, they're hard to find and they're, they're They're hard to find. Um, and the, you know, they have, um, aluminum bars, training bars that are appropriately weighted and sized for a seven-year-old. Um, so if that person or that kid expresses direct interest in doing these movements, then we do them. There's no reason why they shouldn't do them. And the program is really going to be the exact same as or the concepts for programming for them are going to be the exact same as they would be for anyone else. We would start them on a novice linear progression. And as they, their, as their adaptability and their recoverability started to decrease, we would change the program in response to how they're responding. Um, now, because youth athletes are growing their bodies are going to be consistently changing so they might be on a linear progression for a very very long time because of how much weight they gain how much their body grows and they're you know changing and and um uh, their body has to readapt to their new size (laughs) um So we cannot say how specifically to program for them, but I would start them on a novice linear progression and utilize all the same principles that you would when you're adjusting the program to match the person's response to training. And as they continue to progress from novice and transition into intermediate and then transition into advanced. Um, Something that I would say that we need to consider, and Alyssa, we've talked a lot about this, is that children or adolescents have less body awareness and less control over their bodies than we do. And also because their bodies are changing so much, we do need to be a little slower and more careful with how fast we're progressing them and how hard or or how high of an intensity we're allowing them to train at and for how long. So I think that the biggest difference for youth athletes um, is the equipment that you're using because it needs to match their size and their ability and how the rate at which you're progressing. Would you agree? 
Yeah. So I, a youth athlete, I would definitely progress slower than an adult starting out. Generally speaking, there are certainly some adults that are going to add a pound to a lift every session, right. but, yeah. but it really, it just depends. And then the other thing I would say is that when we say, you know, starting them with barbell training, that might look like dumbbell exercises to start or kettlebell exercises to start as they're learning the movements, uh, depending on their age, their ability, their experience, and all of these other factors before, you know, teaching them a barbell squat, maybe we'll do a goblet squat, but it can progress in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that for, um, for those individuals who are not directly expressing interest in the barbells initially, we would start with different implements like the the um, kettlebells, dumbbells, equipment, whatever. Um, and we would probably incorporate more exercises because those training sets, like if you're just doing three sets of five with the dumbbell and on each lift that's going to take like 20 minutes <laughs> you know like we want to keep these kids occupied for a little longer than 20 minutes um their resistance training sessions i think that they can tolerate like 45 minutes to an hour i guess that's the other thing is like with kids we have to think about their um they're in school they have homework they have extracurricular they have um they have uh, other sports. So we also have to think about how much time they can spend training and how many days a week they can spend training. So I would limit strength training to 45 minutes to, in the younger, like in the younger youth to like an hour, hour and 15 in like the high school athlete. Um, and I would say two times a week is solid. Um, if they're out of season, so it's like they're not in, co in their competitive season for their sport. They can do three times per week um, if they want to, but they can definitely get away with twice per week. And if they're in season, they can do two days a week at, for maintenance, not to like really push too hard um, because we want to remember that they've got practice, they've got homework, they've got competition, they have, you know, all these things. They have social activities, holidays, everything. So we want to be really careful. Um, with the youth athlete from that sense, because in essence, they have more responsibility than adults do. Adults go to work, they take care of their family and they go to the gym. Kids, they're, you know, they, you know, they have so much on their plate with school every day. Like when you think about it, I always think about this, like kids have so much on their plate, you know, and we don't even really think about how, how stressful that is for kids. They have school every day. They've got to be like some kids in my town have to be at school at like 720 in the morning. Like imagine if you had to be at work every day at 720 and then, then you had to go to take a bus to, to like extracurricular or like, you know, and then you're not home until like six o'clock. Like that's so much for a kid. Then they have to do homework and they're up until 10 o'clock at night doing homework, you know? So we just have to kind of think of like what, stress is placed on that child outside of training um now in terms of adaptive athletes Lisa, do you have any any insight there yeah so when we talk about adaptive athletes we don't know exact exactly what they are able to do and really starting out we have to find out what what they want to do what they're interested in what they can do because they absolutely can lift and train. And there are even competitive sports where they can participate. Mm -hmm. Um, and really, you know, it's even like if we, if we have somebody who's had a surgery and we need to modify things or, or adapt things for them, we can, we can adapt the movements. We can start off slow, mm -hmm. light, whatever it is, you know, we don't know if they're coming to us having had experience versus not, or they're just starting out but really getting a feel for what is it they want? Mm -hmm. What is it they can do? And I would say be creative, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in figuring out ways to add resistance to movements in certain, in their planes of movement that they can move through and using different implements. If a barbell is not necessarily appropriate for a certain, for a certain movement for them, mm -hmm. but it's, very doable. We it's, might just have to think outside of the box of what 
what the lifts look like generally. Yeah, and it's so funny because we actually have um, – I don't know when this is going to air on the podcast. So if you're listening to this on the actual podcast, we're recording this in our Facebook group in March of 2023 and we have a whole like our whole content plan for the rest of the year and we're doing a month on upper extremity and a month on lower extremity and as physical therapists we work with individuals who have surgeries to their arm or their leg or their shoulder you know and or their abdomen their neck their back whatever and Oftentimes people feel that they can't train because they don't have the use of one of their limbs at the moment because they have surgery. So what we have planned into these content months is literally like how to train with one leg, <laughs> you know? So, and, and Alyssa just always like laughed when she's like, I keep thinking you mean like with an amputation, <laughs> but you know, it could be anything, you know, you could have an ACL reconstruction, you could have a quad tendon repair, you could have a foot surgery, an ankle surgery, um, you know, you could have a hip surgery and you can't use that one leg for a period of time. But then there's also athletes who actually only have one leg. And we have the same thing in the upper extremity when we have a surgery that we have to protect and we can't use for a while. How can we still continue to train our upper body uh, without stopping because of this surgery or this this limb removal or amputation or whatever, right? So, and then there's, you know, there's many other things in, in regards to adaptive athletes, you know, some are cognitive and some are physical and, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it could be a wheelchair or whatever. So we definitely have to get creative. There's not one answer for any situation that you could ask, like any type of situation that you could ask us about. It's what can the person do? What do they want to do? What are their, what equipment do they have available? And then say, okay, how do we do it for this person? Right. Um, yep. And if you have, if you're working with an adaptive athlete, who's maybe doing competitions and this is new to you, mm -hmm. look up the rules, look up yep. what they can do, what they can't do, because they're those, that's going to be different. It might open up some doors and, you know, regardless of the level that they're training at, if you're at a loss for ideas, look up what other, you know, the internet can be dangerous, but you also have <laughs> access to, you know, how, other people are doing things. And this is, this is a scenario where you might gain some information from seeing how other adaptive athletes are training or modifying movements. Yeah. And chances are they're not the first person to go through this, you know, they're just not. So you can find it on the internet. You can find videos or someone sharing their story or whatnot. Like we get a lot of ideas from the internet because that what is that's what the internet's for, you know? It's for research. It's for access to information and all that kind of stuff. So like you said, Alyssa, if you don't know where to start, look up the rule book. Look up other – look for other athletes who are experiencing the same issue maybe reach out to them or just watch their videos, read their story or whatnot, and look for ideas in, in other places, you know, because someone has walked this path before. 